We're very excited about the schedule today and, and the motivation behind it. Um, this was an event that actually was inspired and requested by our chancellor, Howard Gilman, who wanted to have an opportunity this year to kind of celebrate, highlight, and talk about um, what's happening nationally in teaching and also the role that UCI is playing in it. And, and basically as an opportunity to inform the campus of a lot of what's happening and going on right here at UCI. So we've arranged the day around a couple of different activities and themes. We do have three keynote sp speakers um, spread throughout the day. Um, in the morning, we'll have two panels, one in here and one in the other rooms, which are roughly out that way. <laughs> um, I'm new, so not quite oriented yet. The panel and discussion in here will be on active learning and what's been happening here at UCI. And the other panel and session will focus on online technologies and various aspects of online learning, both from implementation to research and various, various areas like that. Um, after lunch, we will actually have a student panel in this room. We have four students coming to talk about their experiences um, at UCI in general, but also what they would like to see in the future of teaching. Um, and then the afternoon sessions from the UCI faculty are going to be three parallel sessions um, that will be a series of basically lightning talks, um, three faculty in each session for 30 minutes, just so you can get a sense of what faculty are doing in their own classrooms or what projects they're interested in. Um, at the end of the day, we're closing with a um, blue ribbon panel. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I can say that with me being on the panel, but of, of myself, um, Richard Aram, uh, Willie Banks and Diane O'Dowd to talk about different aspects of what we're doing in the um, space of teaching here at UCI. So I think it promises to be a very exciting and fun day. Um, there's coffee and drinks in the back and there'll be various breaks and then lunch of course provided at 12.15. So hopefully you'll get a sense by the end of the day of both some of the trends nationally and where UCI fits in that. That is really our goal here. And then for those of you who braved coming out um, today and making it over to the Cove, you'll go back to your units and share what you learned. Um, the talks are being recorded, and so we will be making them available later on on the web um, to share and for other people to um, view them at a later date. Um, are there any questions about the day or any logistics before we get started? Okay, well with that, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, Karen Marangelf is visiting us here. Um, she is Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation for Education and Human Resources. Um, it's exciting to have her here. She got to spend some time yesterday um, with ver visiting the campus. Um, she leads the EHR Directorate in supporting research that enhances learning and teaching to achieve excellence in US sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM education. Prior to joining NSF, she was Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Portland State University and Professor of Mathematics and Statistics, where she oversaw 24 departments and programs across the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. Um, one of the other things I wanted to just highlight is her research has focused on learning and teaching of undergraduate mathematics with a particular focus on the role of the teacher in orchestrating inquiry-based or active learning in mathematics classrooms. Um, and she's led several statewide K-12 mathematics professional development research efforts with NSF funding. I think this is very relevant and exciting to what we're trying to do at UCI. Many of you are aware that we recently opened the Anteater Learning Pavilion. It's been open for a year and a half which is our all active learning classroom building. Um, and we're very proud of our Active Learning Institute and our efforts around that. And so it's a nice synergy and connection um, with Karen's interests. So with that, I'll welcome Karen and turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is really such a delight to be here. And I have to say that there are no stages like this in DC anywhere. So <laughs> this is really quite a treat. Um, I am absolutely pleased and honored to join you um, to kick off this summit on teaching in the 21st century and to be here on your amazing campus. Um, 
As, uh, as Michael alluded to, I did have some time yesterday afternoon to spend with some of your outstanding um, education and engineering faculty. And so I hope that what I'm going to talk with you about today uh, is going to resonate with you. I think that it will based on everything that I've been hearing and learning about the work that's going on here. And I really look forward to the questions that you have for me during the discussion because I think you're going to help me push my own thinking forward. I want to start by thanking Chancellor Gilman um, and Vice Provost uh, Denon for this invitation and for this opportunity to participate in, in this event with you. Um, I'm excited to talk about NSF's role in the future of STEM education and education research. And though the work that we do at NSF is particular to the STEM disciplines, I think that you will find that a lot of what I talk about today and a lot of the work that we fund also has relevancy outside of the STEM discipline. So I know that not everyone here is a STEM person. Um, and I've tried to frame some of what I'm talking about in the broader context of teaching. Um, and so today I titled my talk, The Future of Teaching and Teaching for the Future, um, Advancing Discoveries in Education to Drive the Scientific Enterprise. So today what I hope that you will take away are three things. First, that there is still a lot about teaching that we need to learn. Um, the next is that the work of teaching is changing. And finally, that diversity, equity, and inclusion are critical if we are continue if we are to continue to evolve as teachers. So I want to applaud you on the work, the great work that you do here on this campus to help educate our nation's youth. We have a shared goal of ensuring that the publics of all ages, backgrounds, and areas of this nation are able to access and learn about the wonders of science. And at NSF, our mission is to promote the progress of science to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. And to do this, we need strong and innovative science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. NSF's investment in STEM education dates back to the agency's authorizing language. That's 70 years ago. And in fact, we just celebrated NSF's 70th anniversary. And we took a look back at some of the amazing discoveries and innovations that resulted from our investments in research and researchers of all ages. Our decades of funding have in, of basic research have led to many of today's familiar technologies and innovations. Some examples are the internet, 3D printing, solar panels, the touch screens on our smartphones, and the list goes on and on and on. The basic research that we support is conducted at K-12 schools, colleges and universities, in states, territories, and communities across the country. And these investments have enabled us to address some of the most pressing challenges in science, engineering, and in education. However, we still have much work to do in education as persistent problems continue to exist. Which brings me to my first point. There is still a lot to learn about teaching. For instance, we are still working to understand the most effective ways to connect in-school and out-of-school learning experiences in meaningful ways for all students. We're trying to figure out how to successfully integrate findings from research on learning and cognition into teaching practices that are successful for diverse learners. We are also still working to understand some vexing problems in content areas. As a mathematician, one of my favorite is why fractions are so difficult to learn and how we can teach them effectively, not only in the third and fourth grades where students first experience them, but through their work in undergraduate and even graduate school. Um, other questions that continue to perplex us are things like, how does one teach engineering design to a classroom of neurodiverse learners? We need to take up more focused research areas to make progress on these vexing problems of learning and teaching. And I think from some of the examples that I've seen just in the short time I've been here, you are doing some of that. Now more than ever, it's critical that we ask questions about what is possible to learn with both technology and changing content for teaching and learning. There is a clear need for us to accelerate the pace at which we first understand how advances in technology can change the landscape of education and help solve some of these persistent problems. And second, how education must change itself in order to prepare for a world more deeply infused with AI and technology. By this, I really mean moving away from way beyond conversations about whether to teach online or not. 
As we have seen just over the last few weeks with the outbreak of the coronavirus, schools, entire school systems in countries at the K-12 and post-secondary levels have completely shut down. We have the technology for students to continue their education, but yet we struggle being able to deliver effective education to them in this critical time. That is on us because we have had this technology for so many years. It is our responsibility to understand how to implement it. Digital platforms have afforded data as well that provide unprecedented insight into student behavior and learning. Data that must be treated ethically and with care, but also that make it possible to advance personalized and precision learning for large numbers of students. This is so exciting and this is at our doorstep as I speak. So because the work of teaching is changing, this brings me to my second point. Um, Oh, and I also wanted to say, just a little plug, <laughs> that I'm very excited for the session that follows this one on advances in online and virtual learning. And you have some amazing experts right here on your campus that have been leading the way. So I, I'm going to be at that session, um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning, learning more about what's happening on your campus. Um, so when we think critically, we, we, we need to continue to think critically about how we learn and the interplay of human skill with pervasive, intelligent, and autonomous systems. And this becomes increasingly important as we achieve advances in technology. And this is really what I mean when I'm talking about the work of teaching is changing. Technology has moved beyond just simply allowing us to access a large amount of information on our phones or on our computers. Technology now can help us actually think differently and visualize things differently and in new ways. And our methods of teaching must reflect this new reality of augmented cognition. As we invest at NSF in future-oriented STEM education research, we continue to explore some of these persistent questions about the learning and teaching of STEM com content. But we also must ask ourselves, what are we doing to ensure that both students and educators are ready to address the changing landscape of work that is here and on the horizon? Some of our current research that we fund at NSF um, and our questions about teaching will become obsolete just given the advances of technology. And other of those questions will persist. So we, have, we face a dual challenge at this point, one of keeping our eye on the future and the other eye identifying the findings of the past and present that will continue to ground what we know about teaching and learning. So there are a number of questions that we must consider. And I like to, as a mathematician, I'm always looking for patterns and making sense of, of, of data and things. And I like to try to put things in boxes. But as I think about what the future of teaching looks like and I think about the persistent problems of today, there, there is a lot of overlap and, and intersections. And so as I thought about some of the questions that are really on the forefront, it's a mix of looking to the future and it's a mix of, of continuing to understand what do we need to know to better serve our students in the teaching and learning space. And so here are some of those questions that, that I think are really at the top of the list for me. What are the skills that are most critical for the future of teaching and how will AI or new technologies drive us forward? And in particular with this, what will our undergraduates look like in 2050? What, will, what training will they need at that point and what will their learning environments be like? And I think this is a really exciting question to think about in terms of what the learning environments could look like. Some other questions are, how do we effectively provide professional development to current and future faculty, both using methods that we know have worked. I'm going to talk a little bit more about professional development later on in this talk, but also thinking again about the advances in technology and how that might impact the field of professional development. Another question is, what are the gaps in our collective knowledge about effective undergraduate pedagogy? A lot of work has been done in this space, but there's still more work here that needs, needs to be addressed. And finally, how do we respond to the increasing pressure to, main, to maintain global competitiveness? Maybe this is just from where, where I'm sitting right now in DC, but this, this certainly is, um, is of high priority for uh, a lot of my colleagues around the foundation. So to help us think about these and other pressing questions, um, NSF a few years ago unveiled the 10 big ideas. 
These are bold, long-term research ideas that identify areas for future investment and, by design, require multidisciplinary teams and convergent approaches, including with the education sector. And I would say that in all of NSF's 10 big ideas, there are components and impacts for education in all of these. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but I will be mentioning some projects that fit into the future of work at the human technology frontier, um, and, and the NSF includes big idea as well. These big ideas will provide opportunities for the education and training of the next generation of scientists. This is our belief that, of what will happen through these 10 big ideas. The research themes presented here exist at a scale that goes beyond any one discipline. They require convergence or interdisciplinarity, and we need to innovate models of education to prepare the next generation of scientists to work within this realm. Um, as I mentioned, the future of work at the human technology frontier, it specifically includes and invites projects, and we have funded some projects that envision the future of education work at all levels and in all settings. Um, so we need to continue to think about what those education spaces may look like in the future. We have also at NSF aligned our vision for future-oriented research with the administration's priorities for industries of the future. These include AI, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, and quantum information science. Over the long term, research in these areas has the potential to answer important scientific questions as well as reshape how we live, work, and teach. For example, last year, NSF launched the National AI Research Institutes. One of these institutes focuses on advancing AI-driven learning innovations, which will radically improve human learning and education at large in both formal and informal settings, training, on-the-job training, and across the lifespan. So we're very excited about ways to connect up with these particular industries of the future. I think there's also um, places within these industries of the future that we can really bring diversity and equity to the forefront. I'm going to say a little bit more about that as well. So advancing the novel use of technologies will help increase student learning outcomes in these emerging fields in particular. Educational technology must be coupled, however, with a deep understanding of cognition and learning data science, programming, and statistics, which are the skills that students will need to excel in the workplace of the future. So our technologies and the learning environments must work together to enable pedagogical approaches that promote student-centered learning. One example I just want to pull is the NSF-funded Center for Innovative Research in Cyber Learning. And the Cyber Learning Program at NSF has been around now for, for several years. Um, and they are really trying to push the envelope of the questions that we ask about how education and technology intersect. I want to give you a flavor of some of the questions that the projects that are funded through the Cyber Learning Program are investigating. One is looking at how, how we use robots to mediate learning in early elementary uh, linguistically diverse classrooms, um, which is really exciting to see little kids interacting with robots um, who are speaking many languages, and the robots are actually helping the children talk to each other and learn from each other. Another project is investigating a question around how can a modular robotics platform support algebra learning in a distributed group work and collaborative learning environment. And this is a project that teams a mechanical engineer with a math education cognition expert to figure out how we improve student participation in group work. So right to the core of active learning. And what I love about that project is that it is bringing together scholars from across the disciplines to help solve some of these persistent problems in education. I could go on and on with examples like that, but these are some of the exciting things that are happening in the what we're calling the cyber learning space. Um, I want to now highlight um, a few projects that have been on the cutting edge in the area of teaching. Um, and what's interesting as I was researching these projects is right now both of these examples I'm going to show you are originated about 15 years ago and they're still kind of considered the cutting edge. So we've got more work to do in this space. Um, this one I absolutely love. Uh, this is called Teach Live and it's a project that originated out of University of Central Florida. Um, and an educator there was wondering, could teachers improve their performance through simulation, much like some other professions do through simulation? Um, and she teamed up with a faculty member, a colleague in the computer science department, and they figured out a way to create a simulated classroom for both pre-service and practicing teachers to practice their teaching. 
Um, so the, the teacher or the pre-service teacher views a screen, and this is the, the simulated classroom that you see behind me. Um, and they, um, so this is projected onto a wide screen. The teacher is also recorded so that their actions are, um, are fed back into uh, to someone who behind the screen is then um, is then reacting to the teacher through the student avatars. So this is a combination of both technology and humans because there are there is a human behind the screen who's who's playing the role of each of the students um, in response to real life time of of what the teacher is doing. So I mean this is this is great. This is the kind of work that we need to see more of in the teaching realm. Um, it's intimidating to get in front of a classroom and try things out. Um, and so this is creating a safe space, a realistic space, to simulate what actually happens in a classroom and to really push our forward, our thinking about how do we deal with student thinking, student misconceptions, um, all of the things that go into the social dynamics of a classroom. Um, this is now used in 80 schools of education across the country. Um, this was first built with, these are middle school students, or supposed to be middle school students that you see behind me. They, um, they built up to build classrooms of high school students, and more recently, their newest ventures include creating avatars that represent students with disabilities and designing an entirely new classroom with kindergarten-aged avatars. I would love to see that one. Um, even further, um, addressing the challenge of connecting in-school and out-of-school learning that I mentioned previously, they're now trying to adapt this technology to be used outside of the classroom to help children with autism develop communication skills. And the project has even grown beyond just educational spaces. It's expanded its reach in the community from helping to prepare college students for job interviews to helping hotel clerks develop better customer service skills. So, great example of the type of innovative technology work that we can apply to teaching. Given the advances in the last 15 years that have happened in technology, I think we can even improve upon this model. The next project that I wanted to highlight in this space um, is one that also began some 15 years ago with, some, with NSF funding. Um, and this is called Assistments. Uh, this was created by two middle school teachers, one who went on to become a computer scientist. They were middle school math teachers. Um, and they were frustrated with the lack of um, timeliness and feedback that teachers would get when they sent students home with homework. And so what Assistments does is it's a platform that works with middle school math teachers with any textbook that they're using, any curricula, if they're developing their own homework problems, it doesn't matter, the, the platform can plug in. And when teachers send students home with homework assignments, assistments connects in and tracks the students, giving them hints along the way for their homework, but also is collecting data about how many times they're attempting problems. Where among the class are students having difficulty with some of the homework problems? Are they attempting it two, three, four times? How many hints do they need? And then assistments feeds this data back to the classroom teachers so that they can plan for the next day's class and adjust as needed to respond to, to, to student learning. Um, this is also used widely throughout the US at this point. About 1,000 teachers are using it um, in 42 different states. And it has been shown in a rigorous randomized control trial to increase student learning. Um, so this is really wonderful, and, and I think we have, have, we have had other projects of this ilk in the last several years, building on projects like assistments and our decades of NSF funding for cognitive tutors. Um, currently, researchers at NC State are developing cognitive assistance to provide uh, real-time support for teachers. This is in the classroom as they implement collaborative problem-based STEM learning. And this is, this is particularly, this project at NC State is responding to the need to improve STEM teacher performance and increase the quality of teacher work life, knowing that the decisions that a teacher has to make um, on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis in the classroom are so many, especially as a teacher is trying to pull off collaborative problem-based work. So I'm thrilled to see some of this work on cognitive tutors really taking off, really thinking about putting students at the center and equipping teachers with the types of data and tools that they need to make decisions in real time. And so as we understand more about how technology can, can transform teaching and learning, we must be intentional in our efforts to ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion are front and center, which brings me to my third point. For decades, NSF has invested in efforts to expand access, 
broaden participation, and retain groups traditionally who have not had the opportunity to succeed in STEM fields. Another one of NSF's 10 big ideas is focused on broadening participation. It's called NSF Includes. And I understand that you did have a design development launch pilot grant here at, at UCI, so congratulations on that. Um, through NSF Includes, we have funded more than 90 projects in four years really thinking about taking the pockets of what we know are working to diversify the STEM workforce and scaling them up. Um, one example is the STEM Core Alliance led by Saddleback College here in California. And this is for forming strategic partnerships to advance an innovative mathematics curricula that moves community college students from intermediate algebra to calculus readiness in two semesters. And sorry for the overabundance of math examples. Um, <laughs> It does resonate with my background. Um, it's also a little, uh, um, just a little mortifying, I guess, that mathematics at community colleges is, just has been shown study after study, year after year, to move students off track of reaching their goals. So this is a really important project, trying to get students to this place of calculus readiness in a short amount of time, um, really recognizing the knowledge that they do bring to the classroom. Um, so the program includes internship opportunities as well, and, um, and, and uh, the, initially the project involved 15 community colleges in three states, but now has expanded to 33 community colleges in many more states. And there are major employers that are connected up with this, with this project, including NASA, some of the Federal Energy Labs, um, and Lockheed Martin, who are offering internship opportunities for participating students. So it's not only focused on getting students through the mathematics content, but also showing the relevancy of what they're learning in the classroom to applications in STEM fields. Um, so many projects um, like this one, um, and this one is using some active learning, uh, many other projects in NSF are, are focused on using active learning pedagogies to broaden participation in STEM education and careers. Um, however, in order to do so, we first must understand what effective undergraduate STEM pedagogy looks like. And I think luckily we have some good results in this area. Um, I want to talk about this um, PNAS paper. Hopefully many of you are, are very familiar with this. Um, in 2014, Scott Freeman and his colleagues published this meta-analysis. Um, they were trying to test the hypothesis that lecturing maximizes learning and course performance and looked at 225 studies across the STEM disciplines that reported on data of examination scores or failure rates, and they compared students in lecture classes to students in active learning classes. The results were pretty, were pretty impressive. Um, they indicated that average exam scores improved by about 6% in active learning classes as compared to students in lecture classes only. And students in the classes with traditional lecturing were 1.5 times more likely to fail than were students in active learning classes. I don't think, given what I've heard about what's happening on your campus, that I need to convince you that active learning is, has shown to be an effective method of, of teaching students. Um, so I, I think I'm preaching to the choir, but, but possibly not. Um, but I want to point out some things that this study didn't take into account. Um, and I think that we can and should raise some additional questions from here, um, such as how do these results dovetail with digital learning environments? But I think more importantly, um, how, how do the studies that are reported in this meta-analysis, how have they taken an equity and inclusion lens in the work that they were, that they were reporting on? Um, so we still don't know a lot about the experiences of female and minority students in active learning classrooms or students of different ages um, and what the effects are of active learning on a broad variety of students. Um, and Scott and I actually talked about this point and talked about the need to ensure that we are including diverse populations of students as we interrogate and investigate these questions of undergraduate learning and teaching. Um, I think it's interesting to note that um, I recently did a search through the NSF awards database and there are some 450 current awards at NSF with active learning in the title or in the abstract and that spans across all seven directorates. So active learning really is taking root in all of the STEM disciplines. Um, and I think that I believe, th you know, in theory, when you are engaging with students' ideas, as we're doing in active learning classrooms, we are engaging an equity strategy for our classrooms. But we do have to take into account who who is included in the studies that um, that that we're doing. 
and, and really view education as a partnership with our student. And so as we think about instituting pedagogical change for equity and inclusion, I think there are some, some nice um, uh, results, both from the K-12 um, literature and from other literature that can help guide us. Um, forming faculty learning communities has been shown to, um, to help move forward in pedagogical change and inclusive, um, inclusive uh, uh, learning environments. Um, seeking student input and perspectives, and I'm thrilled, again, to hear that you're, you have a student panel at this, at this event uh, today where you are going to hear about student experiences, so right aligned with what the research is telling us. Um, recognizing and responding to cultural insensitivity, this really requires us holding each other accountable for our actions in this space. And then finally, treating local community colleges as true partners, and I know that you um, you do this on this campus and you have a great, um, a great relationship with your partner community colleges and see a lot of students come here through the community colleges. So th this is really wonderful. Um, along these lines, I think we can look at our MSIs and, and UCI certainly is an MSI of inclusive excellence um, for, for some of the strategies that can help diverse students no matter what campus they live on. Um, and in a recent conversation um, with the um, CIOS group at NSF, we spent a lot of time talking about students who may be invisible on their campuses, um, students of color who are on predominantly white institution campuses who, who are invisible when they're not seeking the supports that, um, that we see coming out of, of what some of the research tells us are incredibly helpful. Um, so here, I just wanted to highlight a few things from a recent National Academies report on minority-serving institutions. I wanted to start by giving you a lay of the land with MSIs. There were roughly 700 MSIs in the nation um, with an established and intentional focus to educate and, and train students of color. MSIs enroll nearly 30% of all undergraduates in U.S. higher education and produce roughly one-fifth of all STEM degrees in the U.S. These are impressive numbers. Um, and over half of all MSIs are two-year institutions. Um, so this National Academies report um, um, promoted that um, higher education leaders, policymakers, and the private sector should take a range of actions to strengthen STEM programs and degree attainment in the nation's minority serving institutions, and that MSIs truly are an underutilized resource for producing talent to fulfill the needs of the nation's current and future STEM workforce. Um, this report went on, and I do encourage you to take a look at this if you haven't. Um, it identified seven promising strategies, and they're listed up here behind me, to support the long-term success of students at minority-serving institutions, and really students at any institution. Um, and uh, there, what was most impactful in this list, and some of these may look familiar, and you might say, like, yeah, we're doing this um, and doing that. Um, but what distinguished this list at MSIs is that they were done with intentionality. Um, and again, I think here on your campus, you have been very intentional about um, reaching goals of inclusive excellence, especially for Latinx students. And so I applaud you for that work. And I think you know very well that it is doing some of these things with intentionality is really what makes this work stick for, uh, for all of our students. Um, so, I want to just say a little bit about, you know, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and when we talk about effective practices for all of our students, it's really important that we know our students. Um, and so I've been taking a look at the national level at um, some characteristics of post-secondary enrollment. And again, I just wanted to share these, some of these numbers with you. Um, it's important at the local level, of course, to understand how numbers fit into your context. Um, so I have some data here from, um, from fall of 2019, so just this past fall. And there were about 19.9 million students who attended colleges and universities in the fall of 2019. And of those, 16.9 um, million were undergrads, and then the rest were, of course, graduate students. Um, and um, of those 19.9, 12.1 million attended school full-time, and 7.8 attended part-time. Um, of those 19 million, 6 million were in two-year institutions, and the balance were in four-year institutions. And when we look at other demographic breakdowns of these students, 11.3 um, were female, 
and of course the balance was male. Um, and sorry for the, this is the federal government is still a little bit behind the times on how we identify gender, um, and, and that's just how it is. Um, and then we can see the breakdowns of racial and ethnic diversity in the students who are in our classrooms. And probably none of this is very surprising to you. But I think it's really important for us to take stock of um, does this challenge any of our perceptions about who is in our classrooms, um, who is attending college. And the last part of this um, that I want to focus on, and this is probably motivated by my background coming from an institution, Portland State University, that, um, that serves a lot of adult returning students. Um, 12 and a half million of those 19.9 .9 were under the age of 25. That leaves a pretty big balance of students who are 25 years or older. Um, so students with families, students who may be working full time, students who have demands on their time uh, that, that are different from, from, from what, the, um, what our student population may have looked like many years ago. Um, okay, and, and I think because we know that teaching, if we're making effective changes in teaching, we really can't do this without professional development. Um, and so I want to just say a few things about professional development. We have a, a lot of learning from the K-12 space about what's effective, and I'm going to talk in, in just a couple of seconds about some of that. But we are starting to see an influx of projects at the NSF that are focused on post-secondary faculty professional development, and I wanted to highlight a couple of those. Um, one is the College Mathematics Instructor Development Source, or CoMINES, um, and this is a focus on improving the preparation of graduate students to teach undergraduate mathematics. Um, this project created an infrastructure that was housed, supported, and sustained by the Mathematical Association of America to enhance the mathematics community's ability to provide high-quality teaching-related professional development to graduate students. So they created communities of practice, online resources. They even provided um, distance professional development to graduate students who did not have sites at their institutions but were still expected to, to teach undergraduates. And this has really taken off, has been sustained. So they, they built sustainability into this model that the Math Association of America is now carrying this project forward. So I think this is really quite lovely. And I know that there's been many campuses who have who have very concerted efforts, I know you do here, on, um, on uh, working with learning assistants, working with teaching assistants to really improve their understanding of student learning and their own teaching. A second one um, is the uh, um, improving undergraduate STEM education project um, out of um, UC Berkeley. And I know that UCI here has been a part of this. this um, th they received NSF funding to expand a program that they had. Um, this was, um, this was focused on improving STEM undergraduate teaching and learning um, and is, is now working throughout the state of California to cultivate institutional capacity to provide support for STEM faculty to improve their teaching practice through development and implementation and then also develop community and complementary instructional practices between STEM faculty in two and four year institutions across California. It has some features that are similar to CoMINES, um, but also nurtures an interdisciplinary learning community providing continuous support and is situated within a faculty's everyday work, which is a, an important lesson learned from K-12. Um, right now, um, there are seven UC campuses involved in this project, 12 CSUs and 36 California communities colleges. Um, and this project really nicely focuses on um, deepening faculty's understanding of how people learn and changing, thinking about changing teaching behavior to support student learning, um, and while all the while um, developing faculty's practices of reflection. Um, so while um, we are beginning to see a research base in post-secondary professional development for faculty, really we have a lot of lessons learned from K-12 professional development. I just want to highlight these and then just pose a couple of questions. Um, so we know from our work at the K-12 system that professional development should be intensive, ongoing, and connected to practice. So one-shot workshops do not work. Um, we've seen this proven time and time again, but intensive continued work with teachers that is meaningful to them, that results in changes. We also know that professional development should focus on student learning and address the teaching of specific content. This is critically important because, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm in my class as a mathematician, I need to understand 
the particular misconceptions that students may be bringing into my class about mathematics. And maybe their understanding of physics isn't completely applicable. Of course, there are general ideas about student learning that permeate across all the disciplines, but the disciplinary specificity is incredibly important. Um, third, that professional development should align with school improvement priorities and goals. And we have seen incredible professional development programs completely fail when administrators change, when principal, principals change or district leaders change in the K-12 systems. We have lots and lots of documentation of this. And then finally, professional development should build strong working relationships among teachers. Again, what, how you sustain and root change is through getting everyone, or mostly everyone, on the same page. So I think when I, when I look at these, um, I really try to think about are these the, um, are these, would, are these the same principles that, that should be applied to post-secondary, or would any of these change or modify a bit? So I think we have some work to do to, to think about these. All right, and then finally, I just want to end with, um, we also need to focus on the people who are in our classrooms um, because we can talk about the work of teaching, we can talk about the work of teaching changing, but it's really, really important that, um, that we also are aware that, that, that these are people um, and that we're people and how do we keep, how do we keep our teachers um, content and happy and supported in their jobs. And so um, our advanced program, the NSF advanced program, which has been around now for about 20 years, um, has really given us some key lessons about how we recruit, retain, support, and empower faculty, particularly women faculty and women of color, but really all of our faculty. And so I just want to briefly mention four key lessons from the advanced program. Um, one is that um, institutional um, structures um, should be enhanced. Um, and really what this means is that written and unwritten policies, procedures, and practices can unintentionally create inequities, and we need to be aware of that. So reviewing, revising, increasing the transparency and effective implementation of recruitment, promotion, and tenure policies, for instance, would fall under how we enhance in, um, instructional uh, institutional structures. Um, the next is work-life support. Um, and, and again, this gets back to successful recruitment, retention, and promotion of both female and male faculty is related to job satisfaction, which is highly influenced by work-life balance. And we keep seeing studies coming out um, that support that statement. Um, we know that advanced institutions have benefited from developing and implementing flexible career policies that address life transitions and other needs identified by faculty climate surveys and other data, for instance, um, or developing career support programs to mitigate issues for faculty faculty such as isolation and solo status. Um, the third here is equitable career support. And these are important for recruitment, retention, and promotion of all faculty, but particularly women and, and men of color. Um, this may involve establishing formal mentoring structures and providing recognition of the service and time of the mentors, um, developing unbiased mechanisms to make service teaching and resource assignments, or developing broader me mechanisms to recognize the wide range of professional e excellence of faculty. And I loved walking around your campus and seeing banners of um, faculty who have won awards for research and teaching. I think that's, that's really a quite lovely way to recognize the work of faculty. And then finally, empowerment. Um, and, and our advanced institutions have benefited from providing training on effective strategies to reduce the stressors that result in a greater reliance on implicit biases when making decisions, especially in search, promotion, or in tenure committees, and creating research-driven tools such as templates and checklists tailored to institutional decision-making processes to mitigate institutionalized gender equity barriers. So I, really, I wanted to end with that because as we think about the work that happens to individuals, the work that individuals are doing and happens in their classrooms, the work around them is also influencing, influencing those changes. So in closing, NSF envisions a future for STEM education where all students, no matter where they are born, have access to the highest quality STEM education that takes advantage of the latest in learning, research, and technology. And to do so, we must recognize that the profession of teaching is changing and that our teaching practices must continue to evolve with it. The foundation will continue to invest in the fundamental research and the talented people, the discoveries and the discoverers who improve our daily lives and transform our future. And we know that your campus 
plays an important role in this endeavor. Your work continues to shape new solutions for tomorrow's challenges. Thank you all for all that you are doing to advance science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields for future generations. Together, we can advance discoveries in education to drive the scientific enterprise. Thank you. One thing I'd like to see more is, um, for equity purposes, is also um, the community and uh, also uh, parental uh, parents' involvement. Um, so teaching parents as well um, how to uh, use these, the, you know, I think a lot of the inequity happens when you get home. Um, and also the fact that we assume a lot that, um, for example, I can't even pay my bill for, <laughs> you know, uh, for being online, for example. So just the, the, to, to talk more about um, why there is inequity. Thank you. That's a it's a it's a great point. Um, we've been at the foundation. We have been talking a lot about the role of community, um, both in you know, involving community partners in really meaningful ways, in leadership ways, in the grants that come in to the foundation, particularly in, in EHR, but really across the entire foundation. And we've been funding a lot of work to try to understand the role of community and family um, in student learning um, and the impact on student learning outcomes. So we have several projects um, going on right now in our Division of Research on Learning that, that have been funded that are looking at um, what's the role of family, are there interventions that we can use with family. And this isn't new, we've been, we've been doing this for many years, really trying to understand how we best work with parents, particularly around um, curriculum at the K-12 level that may look different, um, but we're starting to get into more of the sociological um, questions and factors that surround students in their home lives and their out of school lives and how that inter intersects with with what happens in the formal school setting so point very very well taken thank you so much for raising that hi yeah i would have a question about i uh, guess generations in the classroom so you, you probably have young baby boomers in the classroom just as much as you have millennials and maybe like kind of my question is one is like maybe the resistance from older teachers to adopt this stuff and then two even amongst the younger teachers this rate of change will only increase and so is there optimism that because they're millennials they'll keep up or do you think like one day they'll be those kind of those baby boomers and things are moving too quickly um, and they'll and they'll push back so maybe try to some of those things you're trying to overcome and some expectations right great question so i'm not going to speculate <laughs> on on part of that um you know, I, again, I'm going to go back to the K-12 literature. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, some of my colleagues who have done a lot of this work on school change and instructional change um, have said, look, you're not going to move everybody. And, and I think that's a really healthy way to, um, well, I don't know, I feel a little conflicted. On the one hand, it is a healthy way to approach teacher change work. On the other hand, if we know that certain um, interventions work for students and we're not delivering them to them, that I, that I think we have an ethical responsibility to figure out how we do that. So it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, you know, if, so I think we need to continue to work with all teachers, with all faculty, knowing I, the reality is um, it, it is really difficult to get 100%. So I think some of the points that I put up there about professional development, I mean, why it's so important to have faculty learning communities, um, why it's important to have groups of faculty working and not do professional development in isolation with just one or two is exactly to this reason, oh, all my colleagues are doing this. Um, I, I better think about this. I might, I might need to think about how to change. Um, I, you know, the, the technology is changing rapidly. So um, 
will will younger I mean younger generations just are a little more adept at rolling with changes in technology. I mean how they will fare as you know they become teachers in our classrooms and they're educating the next generation of students. I think we can learn some lessons now that we may be able to apply to ensuring that they are open to changes in technology, um, you know, attending to issues of diversity, equity, inclusion as they're making changes to their teaching practices and so forth. So I'm very hopeful, <laughs> but for, for a variety of reasons. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was really inspiring to see the big picture and also some specific examples. Um, I have a kind of a broad general question. I'm wondering from your perspective with your, um, in your area at NSF, what are some common misconceptions about NSF or um, things that you wish people at UCI would know, uh, faculty or administrators, something that um, we might, you might be able to share with us? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that there is a perception out there, and there may be a little bit of, there, of course, if it's a perception, there's, it's real to some people, um, that we fund a lot of safe research. Um, and that is, it's such a dichotomy for me because I feel like every day I engage with, you know, folks that are doing just incredible things in so many of the spaces, the industries of the future that I put up. And just when I think about some of the future of work projects that are going on, um, what we're trying to do in quantum and really move the field of quantum, quantum information science forward, it seems very forward thinking. But the perception out there is that you know, we fund a lot of safe research. We've been trying to take some steps to counter that. The Division of Undergraduate Education last year, um, they released an accelerating discoveries program description and just said, hey, you know, if you have an idea that you feel is not gonna get funded in one of our regular programs, send it in. We're looking for stuff that's really future looking. And they got in some exciting proposals and funded some exciting proposals. Um, so I think that's that's a kind of like number one, and maybe I'll give a second one. Um, in the Director for Education and Human Resources, we fund, we fund very basic research. So a lot of the research that we fund is on the R&D scale, and it is use-inspired and responding to, to problems. But we also fund like, very basic research. We, do, we fund lots of researchers that are working with babies, for instance, um, understanding babies at like six months old, um, <laughs> thinking about numeracy. So do we know the applications of that? tomorrow, no, we don't know the applications. There may be some applications down the road, but I think that's also important to know that curiosity-inspired research is very alive and well in the Directorate for Education and Human Resources, and we welcome that type of research. That's a great question, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering if you could say a little more about the intersection between research on pedagogy and teaching and learning and research on uh, institutional and educational policy. Um, for example, the simulated classroom that you had there had five students in it, but I know plenty of middle school teachers with 45 students right. in their classroom. So what does that look like in this simulation or what can we, how can this, this work intersect within um, questions and research around how we're funding public education, what um, public institutions are looking like? Yeah, um, another great question. This is awesome. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think for a lot of the research that we fund on, on learning, teaching, cognition, we, ha we have to start somewhere. Um, and this is, you know, I, when I, early on, like early in, in some of my comments, I mentioned that it would be, it, I think it's really important that we focus our research on some of the perplexing problems. So let's just take this example of, you know, if we're trying to improve middle school instruction, say in science through through an avatar program like this. Of course we need to do the basic research, but, but you're absolutely right. We also need to understand what are the institutional contexts, both in terms of what the realities of the classroom look like, but also the realities of the school. Um, like what happens if you, you know, are handed a curriculum and said, you have to teach page 17 on day four, um, and you, you're getting information that your kids aren't to that point yet. So I think, so, when we, this is where I think in, in STEM education research, we really do need to um, find some areas, identify areas where we would have concerted effort so that we have scholars who understand um, learning sciences, who understand teaching, who also understand policy context and school change context, all working in concert on a, a bigger issue. Um, so right now I would say, you know, the translation 
it doesn't always happen. Um, you know, it kind of depends on who the scholar is and how they're taking their line of research, moving it forward, or just staying within a, a space of really, you know, trying to understand how students are thinking. Um, but we sometimes get stuck there and then don't think about the bigger policy issues. I also have plenty of examples where we do, I mean, we've understood so much about school change, the impacts of schools, the impacts of district policies. So, I mean, we fund kind of, at NSF, we fund all of this. Um, but to do it in a coordinated way is, I think, what we need. Um, and, and I'll just mention, you know, NSF is one of only two federal agencies that funds basic STEM education research. And we fund 90% of it at the federal level. So, you know, we have a fairly large budget, but the amount of that budget that goes to research is, 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 not, is not the totality of, of our budget. So, um, you know, kind of continuing to, um, to pinpoint our efforts around some of these issues is what we really need. We need larger research teams to do that, to do that work. I'm going to actually ask a question then on that coordination issue. Um, one thing we often, I don't know, hear or get comments on from faculty at the university level is, well, if only K through 12 did it right, then we wouldn't have an issue. Um, cl clearly, that's obvious. Um, how much, it, it just struck me, I don't even know this and I should, how much of the research that gets funded is at all coordinated or involving talking between the high schools and the universities. I tend to just see the two separate research efforts, and I'm curious where that overlap is and what that might take. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, we, we do, at universities, we train all those teachers that are in K-12 schools, so that's on us. Um, and we, you know, we tell our teachers, work with the kids as they come to you, so, like, so we need to be doing that too, but that's a little aside. Um, we, so, I would say, you know, most of the research that we fund that involves K-12 schools is coordinated and run through universities. So there is that coordination in terms of researchers and practitioners working together. I heard some great exciting stories last night about some of the work that's happening out of the School of Education here. Um, and really taking on the teachers' questions, really putting them front and center, which is so important. Um, but, but, you know, research on transitions is hard. We have funded some. I could probably count on one hand, maybe two hands, the number of studies in EHR that we have funded on critical transitions, high school to community college, high school to college, community college, to, or two year to four year. Um, so we, we need to do more work. And, and I think our structure, honestly, at NSF is set up to disincentivize that. Because if you wanted to study transitions from high school to college, you've got to figure out, oh, which program is this going to fit in? We kind of have slotted our programs to align with the um, educational stages, um, so K-12 or informal or you know, undergraduate. Even the names of our, di our divisions are spelled out that way. Um, so we can and should be doing more in that space. But, but there is, you know, the, the work that happens at K-12 is it always involves university folks, as, as far as I know. Um, and there is high involvement. But I think like, you know, I was describing in the NSF Includes work, this is happening in pockets. So I think that we have throughout the country pockets of great things that we've been learning that are possible to do in classrooms. But getting that scaled up is, is, is really difficult. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, you mentioned uh, the sector of uh, students, the many millions of students who are over 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, here at UCI, we've been having several conversations around lifelong learning, mm -hmm. um, asking ourselves what our responsibility is as the region's uh, only research university to address the, particularly the STEM needs of the changing workforce in the region. Um, what, what, are, what's, what are the current thoughts uh, at NSF around uh, serving that sector of the population? Yeah, so we, we've also been having a lot of conversation about this. Um, <clears throat> last fall, I was at a, um, at a talk of all places at the Swedish Embassy, um, and they had a panel of higher ed leaders from, um, from Scandinavian countries talking exactly about this issue. And so they were giving examples of what was happening in their countries around higher education involvement in lifelong learning and, and however you want to call it, workforce retraining, workforce development. Um, so, and so that was, I think, I just raised that to say this is something that is 
garnering worldwide discussion. Many of us from NSF went to that talk because just a few months earlier, we entered a partnership with the Boeing Corporation um, where they, um, we each put in $10 million to start to exactly address this issue. So they recognized that they really needed to reskill their workforce. And I'm not talking about factory floor folks for Boeing, but mechatronics, their software engineers, their, their aerospace engineers. Like, they're people with master's degrees and PhDs that, that have to keep up with the changing technology. Um, and so they came to us and said, can you help us? They had previously partnered with MIT and developed some courses and modules, but, but wanted to do this broader. So we funded um, seven or eight projects uh, around the country that are taking on this issue of how do we develop um, open source online uh, kind of modules in, in specifically in these engineering fields um, so that Boeing and other such companies can take can ask their workers to go through these and get retrained and reskilled. At the same time, what's also I think fascinating is Boeing is very interested in understanding what we can learn from the data that are generated by these um, online uh, and digital platforms. And so we, NSF's kind of interest or what we funded around these was how do you then take the data and really start to interrogate what are the progressions of student learning, um, you know, what happens if, you know, you know, worker A, you know, just had a baby, how does, how is that affecting how they're able to interact with the online platforms? Um, so this is, this is a big issue for us. Um, you know, higher education, I think, absolutely needs to be critically thinking about how do we serve that population of workers. Because they, I have just seen example after example since I've been back at NSF of companies that are struggling with these issues. And I think that we have, our, our institutions of higher education have so much to offer in this space. He was tall. Hi. Um, someone earlier mentioned the difference, the possible difference between how pe teachers of different ages will approach technology and new ways of teaching. And I'm sure that he didn't mean anything against <laughs> baby boomers. But um, <laughs> another thing that matters that I've seen is the the national background. A lot of teachers are not raised in the United States. And a lot of people teach, at least when they start teaching, they teach the way they were taught. So someone who has come from another background, maybe they had a very traditional, very lecture-oriented way of learning. And so that's another thing that affects the way that we do professional development for those people. So that is my comment. Thank you. It, it's, yes, that's a very astute comment. Um, I mean, and actually, you know, points out that um, I, we do need to think about how we attend. I mean, I pointed out in the undergraduate learning research space, we need to better attend to issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion, thinking about who are the samples of students who are involved in our research. And I think similarly for professional development, um, there have been some strides in, in attending to issues of div diversity, equity, and inclusion at the K-12 level in professional development research, but it's something uh, that I absolutely agree we need to we need to attend to that as we continue to grow the research base, especially at the post-secondary level. Yes, yeah, so I was intrigued by something you said at the beginning about how um, the sort of technological advances and how we can teach and how, how we actually teach is falling behind that, you know? And, uh, and I kind of feel that you know, UCI was sort of ahead of the curve on this, I and mean, there's a session, as you mentioned, later coming up. But, but even here, it feels like there's a lot of untapped potential. I'm wondering, how are we, how we going to cross that bridge, right? How, where's it going to come from? You mentioned the pandemic, you know, pandemic yeah. one way which shock us into doing this. But is it going to come from, from the center, from government? Is it going to come from students? Where, where do you think this, it's, where the demand is yeah. going to come from to make us reform our teaching in that way? Oh, it's such a great question. I, I feel like I should have a crystal ball up here. Um, I mean, I, I struggle with that question myself. I've thought a lot about that because I see the, you know, I, I feel like I look out and see the, the deep need for us to really engage with some of these changes that, I mean, the way that science is being conducted today 
is with quantum computing and AI is so different. You know, uh, people are doing chemistry not in the lab anymore. I mean, they're doing it by analyzing large data sets and making predictions and then testing those predictions. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so I worry about this. Where's the change going to come from? I think students will, will revolutionize some of this. They are going to demand, I think, some of the technological changes. I, I have a 10-year-old. Um, you know, she is just so, it, technology is second nature to her. Um, I think all of us with kids, grandkids, we see this. I mean, they, they, she has not known a day in her life without, you know, without a smartphone. So, and because the technology is moving so quickly beyond access to information, that like grappling with, and ki like our kids and our grandkids are going to be experiencing the technology helping them think differently. When we, like, I, would, I would love to see us be ahead of that point before our kids get to that point. Because when they get to that point, what we're doing is, is just going to be completely obsolete. So I think, I think our students are going to be driving a bunch of this. Um, you know, in the science disciplines, I think the science is also going to drive some of this. And it already has, when I think about just how different research in biology looks today than it did, you know, 15, 20 years ago. It's all about data analytics. S somehow that still hasn't pushed us to change our curriculum in, in mathematics and in, in data. Um, I can say that as a mathematician. Um, but, you know, but that is going to continue to, I think, drive some of that change as well. So I think just the nature of the work changing and then and our students, that would be my best guess. I wish I had a crystal ball on that one. I, I, I worry about that quite a lot. Time for one last question, or if not, let's thank Karen again. Thank you so much.